Hello, Malcolm here. Thanks for joining me today. This is the second of three classes in the series They Spoke So Effectively, Acts 14 verse 1 for the Thames Valley Churches of Christ. And it also serves as this week's Tuesday teaching tip, number 179. And so we've been going through a three-part series. Firstly, why do we speak? Secondly, what do we speak about? How do we choose effectively what to speak about? And thirdly, presentation, how, how do we speak? So we're in the middle. We did the second class last Friday, but because of the discussion format, it didn't, doesn't really work well to record it for publication. So I'm summarizing the class here today and you can get the handouts on the website, my website and the Thames Valley website. Whether you're listening to the podcast or the video, you should be able to get what you need. So this is the second class, as I say. Now the first class, just to review briefly, was on why do we speak? What's our motivation? We talked about speaking for God or God speaking through us. The key phrase for me, truth, as in God's truth, through personality. For some reason, God knows it's better to speak through humans than to speak directly himself. And so what a privilege it is to be used by God. And you do not have to be an expert speaker to be useful to God in that way. Truth through personality, and I asked a few people to think about that and share, and they did this last Friday, as to their reasons for speaking. And one said because they enjoyed it, God gave them joy in it. A second person said because they believed they had the gift of speaking, and so they should use it. A third person said, he said because they felt they had a responsibility to share what God had been teaching him, so others could be blessed. Very good answers. And then we had a discussion about our topic for the day, which is what to speak about. And I asked everybody, what, how do you know what to speak about? How do you work out? How do you figure out what to speak about? And people said a number of things. Firstly, somebody said, through my personal Bible study, as I read my Bible, I'm asking myself the question, is this something that should be shared? Second person said, considering the needs of the audience will give me insight as to what to speak about. And we'll come on to that a bit more in a minute. And somebody else said, you know, when I pray about it, and I pray specifically asking God, what do you want me to speak about? I tend to get an answer. Lots of good answers were given. So how do we know, how do we know what to speak about? Well, I would say it's an intersection of two things, context and conviction. Now, uh, for the lesson, I handed out A4 sheets with two circles, which I'm gonna hold up to the video. If you're watching the podcast, you can use your imagination. Two circles on a piece of A4, with an intersection between the two, like a Venn diagram. The two circles represent, firstly, context, which is really about the needs of the congregation. What's going on? Uh, what time of year is it? Is it Easter, Christmas? Is it a harvest? Is there a theme to the service for some particular reason? Or has there been a marriage or a baby born recently or a funeral for that matter? What's going on in the congregation? That's your context. And to find that out, you need to reflect need to be part of it, of course, and maybe you need to speak to other people, particularly if you have, say, some people in, in shepherding roles of leadership in the congregation. They may know more about what's going on and the threads in a congregation than you do as an individual. So that's context, one circle, and the other circle is conviction. And this is really about you. What has God been teaching you recently? When you reflect on the last few days, weeks, months, what's God been showing you? It could be through your own Bible study. It could be through experiences in your life. It could be answered prayers. It could be struggles you've been through. What's God laying on your heart as a conviction? Something that's from him to you. That may be very helpful. So that's your second circle here. And, and generally speaking, where these two overlap, the context and conviction, that's where a, a powerful lesson lies. Because at that intersection, you find the needs of the congregation matching what God has been teaching you, and then you have a great opportunity to speak something that's authentic from you, meaningful to you, to the needs of the congregation. And who's to say if that won't be a powerful lesson, given that you're going to be teaching or preaching God's word. So that's the mixture of uh, context and conviction. And when you've thought about that, reflected on that, and prayed about that, and you've come up with something to preach about or teach about, then the next question is, what kind of lesson? I'm talking here about teaching lessons and preaching lessons, but this applies to communions and other things. So what kind of lesson? I think there are two basic types. There are many types of lesson, but we'll do two main ones for today. 
And one is textual, where you pick one passage, maybe a parable as an example. Or the other is topical, which is where you pick a doctrine or a theme or a, an example of someone's life and show threads or, or teach on it through usually more than one scripture, more than one passage, sometimes Old and New Testament. So you've got textual, which is more bounder, more uh, more boundary, I suppose, in one sense, is more more there it is, you can look at it and see it, and topical, which is spread more through the Bible, which you can't quite as easily get into one place, but is another powerful way of teaching or preaching. There are advantages and disadvantages to both, or should we say, challenges to both, but also powerful ways to use them. The, the advantage of the textual sermon is that, for one thing. And I advise most inexperienced speakers to do a textual sermon rather than a topical one. And the reason is, there's your text. You have it, you know what it is, you can see the beginning of it, all of it, and the end of it. And you don't have to go elsewhere. Sometimes you might bring in some extra scriptures to illustrate a point, but there it is, you know what you're dealing with. That's the great advantage. The disadvantage is if you don't if you don't put it in its context of what goes before and after, well, you might be uh, teaching and preaching out of context, but you have that, you know what to focus on, that's the advantage, and in that context you need to do good exegesis. Now, on Friday when we talked about this, someone asked me if I could do a class on exegesis, because it's obviously a, um, an in-depth topic, and so we'll, we'll work that out at some point, hopefully soon. But at the basics, at least, let me tell you this, so exegesis is the opposite of eisegesis. Now, eisegesis is basically reading into the text what you want to see there, hope to see there, or expect to see there. It means reading into the text. It ties in with an old saying, something like, wonderful things in the Bible I see, most of them put there by you and by me. Human beings have the tendency to see what we want to see, but exegesis is not that, it's about drawing out what is there. Drawing it out, which means studying it with as open a mind as possible, trying to put aside our biases, but just saying what is in there. And two questions will help you to stay on the straight, of, straight and narrow with exegesis. The first is to ask the question, what did it mean to the people involved before you ask the question, what does it mean for me and my congregation? Very tempting to, to run to the Bible, find something that, yes, that's what it means for me, without considering what it meant at the time, and that's a little dangerous in terms of accuracy, also in terms of depth. So you want to ask the question, what did it mean? So if it was a parable, uh, what did Jesus intend to get across? What did his disciples understand? What might have been the reason Jesus taught this for the people that were listening? Even why might Luke have recorded it, or Matthew, or Mark? What did the early church need to hear from this? So that's the question we're asking about the early church, about Jesus, about disciples, about whoever is involved. Then we ask the question, once we've answered that, now I know what it meant to them, how does it apply to me and those to whom I will be speaking? So that's one of the main principles of decent exegesis that will help. Now with a topical lesson, let's talk about topical for a minute. Topical in two main types perhaps, one is biographical and one is doctrinal or thematic you might say. So biographical is something like, I want to teach a lesson on Paul or Moses or Abraham and those are great lessons. Or if it's topical it may be something like communion, if it's doctrinal it might be something like grace or baptism or something like that. So you've got different topics and themes and bio biographical things. The thing that's common with all of those is you don't settle on one passage. You need to know or need to have at least some idea of the whole Bible's teaching. This is where topical sermons are a bit trickier. It's easier to go off perhaps in topical sermons than any other, because you really do need to know the whole thrust of the Bible on a topic. Now with a bio biography it's a little easier, although the biographies of some of the Bible characters are so big, there's so much material that it's still challenging, Abraham, Moses, David, Paul for example. Nonetheless, we can do good topical lessons, it's just we need to be aware of our limitations. And one of the things to say to a group if you teach a topical lesson is, of course, I'm only touching the hem of the garment here, uh, there's a lot more to say about Paul or David than we're talking about, but here at least are some things I see in David. So be, perhaps give a caveat in that sense of uh, acknowledging that you're not giving the whole picture, because no one lesson possibly can. 
right? So you've got some, but the advantage of topical is that it might be more directly applicable to your congregation's need. If the congregation is going through a time of mourning, then looking at how the Bible, what the Bible teaches about grieving, um, there's rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn, or blessed to those who mourn for they should be comforted, are sort of perhaps touchstone scriptures, but then what else does the Bible teach about how we handle mourning? That can be very applicable to the congregation if that's what's going on. So that's the advantage, but the challenge is just there's so much to say and so much to study. So that's those are some things to think about when deciding on textual or topical as your key style or approach to your lesson. Then we talked on Friday about what? About lesson planning tips. And again, we could do six lessons on this. So I only touched on some basics. Lesson planning tips. What I did on the day, and I'll just show you on the video. And again, if you're watching the podcast, you'll have to use your imagination. Is I brought along and passed out a number of the templates that I use to help prepare my lessons. So for example, this is a very basic template of title and introduction and points with verses and conclusion, mostly for exegetical um, sermons or expository preaching. Uh, this is a template I use for preparing classes when there might be a lot of interaction. This is more like a teaching class than a preaching lesson. That helps me, that came from a book called Teaching in Further Education by Curzon, which I've adapted, it reminds me to take care of timings as well as the content, but also the methods and the aids I might need to get the points across. That's a template there. I will put PDFs on my website and on the Thames Valley website with these. Here is a template, a very basic template for a topical sermon, where I write down my thoughts on the topic, the key Bible words I might need to look up, Bible dictionary, word book, um, key Bible passages, using a use of study Bible, specialized resources, quotes and illustrations. I had a few other templates, a few of these here. Ah, yes, a different exegetical sermon preparation template here, reminding me to do four steps in my exegesis, to unpack it, unpack the passage, then select from it what's most significant to get across, then engage with the issue so that I understand what it means for me, and then how am I going to deliver it? along with some other thoughts, some key Bible words, quotes, illustrations, and needs. That's one other exegetical template. And I think I have another one here. Let me find it. Oh yeah, that's a bit of a different one. I adapted this from a Michael Hyatt blog template to make a blog style sermon where we have a title and a subtitle followed by a lead paragraph, a personal anecdote, the pivot, to the objective statement, then the rationale followed by a conclusion and finishing with a question. That, that's like a, you could do a good mini lesson, I think, using that template. The point is, not that these templates are brilliant. Um, I'm sure you have some good ones or know better ones than mine. The point is, then I can use a template as a bit of a superstructure, a bit of a, a bit of scaffolding to help me think through what I'm trying to achieve. The idea is not to get locked into the template. The idea is not that we're trying to say, this is the way I must fit into this. In my exegetical sermon template, I have three points. Uh, I don't have three points because I have to have three points. They're just to remind me I need to be clear what my points are. The sermon I preached last, this last Sunday for the Watford Church of Christ in Acts 16, 6 to 10, had two points. It's not the number of points. But looking at the template reminds me Introduction needs to be clear. The conclusion needs to be clear. I need to have clear points and verses next to them. So it's, templates are a tool. They are meant to help us not to uh, put us in a straight jacket. I recommend that you develop your own. You're welcome to look at mine or use them. You'll find more online, I'm sure. But how about developing your own? And I'm just going to say that at the end of the class on Friday, I, I encouraged everybody to just outline one thing using making up their own template. So a communion, a testimony, um, a small lesson. Make up your own template. I think you'll have fun with that. Have fun, be, be creative. Use colors. One of mine I didn't bring actually has colors. In fact, maybe they all went. I still don't have any left over. I think maybe they took them all away, which have different colors for illustrations, for quotes, for personal sharing, again, to remind me that these things are important when I come to not deciding the topic, not even studying the topic, but getting it into order in my thoughts and in how I'm gonna present it such that hopefully it makes sense. 
to the people I'm teaching or, or preaching to. So that's lesson preparation. Now the templates pale into insignificance compared to the key point I wanted to get across last Friday, which is this, the, the, by far more important than that is that we prepare our lessons well in advance, well in advance. Now, if you're phoned up on Saturday evening at 10 p.m. and asked to do the communion because someone's ill, that's fine and different. But I'm talking about when we know a week ahead or two weeks ahead or a month ahead that we're going to be doing whatever it is, then start preparing straight away. Why do we need to do this? Lots of good reasons, but I'll share one main one, which is this. Surely we are hoping as we present God's truth to the people around us when we speak, we are hoping, we are anticipating, we pray that God will speak through his word, through our words, his word through our words, truth through personality to help people, that his word will have an impact on them. It might convict, it might inspire, it might challenge, it might educate. I mean, in lots of ways, God's word helps us. But that's the idea that through us comes something useful to other people from God. So if that's going to happen, surely, first of all, this truth needs to have an impact on you and me. You and me, I know we're just vessels through which the word comes, but there's a lack of power when the word hasn't affected us. In fact, you could say there's a lack of authenticity if we're just standing up talking about God's word when we haven't allowed it to have any impact on us. And this tends to happen when we don't prepare well in advance. But on, alternatively, if we prepare well in advance, it gives God's word time to affect us. We think about uh, whatever the topic might be. Let's say it's about openness. Let's say it's about confession of sin. And we study the text and we think, I'm not as open as, as would be healthy. Let me practice that. Let me pray about it. Let me get to the point where I'm, I'm more comfortable and in fact, and practicing more general openness. As you live that, you will learn things that you can feed into your lesson that will make your lesson a lot more powerful and authentic because it's real, it's coming from you, not just from through in your head, but in your heart and even more importantly, in your life. We've got to live it before we can give it. As has been said, it's not so much that the preacher prepares the sermon as the sermon prepares the preacher. And that's true for all the things we do, testimonies, communions, even welcoming people to church. It's true, isn't it? Think about it. If you thought about why you're welcoming people, if you thought, if you thought about what you're going to say, then it has an effect on the way that you approach being there that day, rather than just turning up and saying the first thing that comes to mind. And it's not really from your heart, is it? So preparing in advance is a big deal. As far as you can, as it depends upon you, so to speak, prepare well in advance. That gives you time to pray through it and to live it. Well, those are the main things we talked about last Friday. The next class is this coming Friday when we'll talk about how to speak, the practicals about voice, about notes, about uh, audio visual, things like that. And if you've got questions about those, please let me know. Drop me a line. The best email is Malcolm at malcolmcox.org, malcolm at malcolmcox.org. If you've got questions, thoughts about that or about this lesson or the previous one, I'd be uh, grateful for your thoughts. And if you have a comment, then leave it publicly. Leave it where we can see it in the comment box because we learn best when we're learning together in community. If you think of anybody who's missed it or might miss it and might like this class, then please pass the link on. And if you're watching the video, please hit the subscribe button, whether it's the Thames Valley channel or my own, please hit that subscribe button, notification button, because then you'll know what's coming out next. You'll see, you'll get some notifications. I think that's all for this week. Handouts you should be able to find on my website or on the Thames Valley website. And looking forward to class number three this coming Friday, which is the 25th of October, 2019. The service begins at 8 p.m. at the Floriat Montague Primary School in Wokingham. And the class will begin around 8.30 and finish around 9. Pray for me as I prepare that and pray that God will speak through you next time you get a chance to stand up or sit down, whichever you're doing, and speak to a congregation, to a group. Then pray that God speaks through you because God's word is powerful. It is powerful. It's effective. Let's be the most effective we can be at sharing God's word by practicing all these things we're talking about learning, uh, uh, getting, uh, gaining our own motivation for why we speak, figuring out what to speak about, and then next week, 
how to do so effectively. Till the next time, take care and God bless.